Hello and welcome. Russian President Vladimir Putin is preparing for elections that no one expects him to lose. So what's the point? Can they be free and fair? In this show, a prominent Putin supporter who denied there was any Russian interference in the U.S. presidential elections now claims that the Russian election is at risk from cyber attacks from the West. Meanwhile, President Putin again raised the specter of nuclear war to warn off any prospects of Western boots on the ground in Ukraine. And Donald Trump's special envoy to Ukraine joins us to referee the diplomatic war of words. And as the war in Ukraine enters its third year, we'll hear from the NATO Supreme Commander in charge when the Russian invasion began. With the body count reaching horrific numbers on each side, is victory on the battlefield a realistic outcome or is it time to talk? But we'll begin with a voice from Ukraine where delays in military support are being blamed for a series of setbacks on the battlefield. Is Western enthusiasm dwindling and is it time for some sort of peace process? I'm joined now from the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, by Kira Rudik, a member of the Ukrainian parliament. She's been urging European leaders to stand strong with Ukraine or to expect Russian ambitions to spread further west. Ms. Rudik, thank you very much for the time. I'm just going to start with the, something that uh, President Zelensky recently said. He said 31,000 Ukrainians had been killed uh, in this conflict. He didn't give any uh, figure on, on those wounded. Now, many sources in the West, for example, in the US and UK, put the figure much higher. Either way, it's a horrific situation and, of course, something that uh, couldn't have been imagined before the, the, the invasion in February 2022. So I wonder uh, how the Ukrainian people are holding up considering, you know, the shock of the, what's happened and, and the ongoing conflict? Well, first of all, the number that President Zelensky announced, no matter what that number would have been, it is still too high. And for us, it is very, very personal because you start counting your own relatives and loved ones who are fighting at the front or whom you have lost. And for every Ukrainian family, this toll is there. And uh, again, because uh, we did not do anything wrong and it just happened, Russia attacked us as an aggressor and we had to lose the best and the bravest. And it is uh, terrifying, but it also reminds us that every day of the delay of the uh, Western weapons and the missiles uh, arriving, we are paying this toll, we are paying an enormous price. So let me ask you then, you know, having hit the second anniversary of this, two years on, how is the mood of the Ukrainian people holding up? Well, first of all, we are very happy that we are alive. And it's this aha moment for the whole world, because if you remember two years ago, not too many people believed that we will stand for more than a couple of days, like a week tops. And it is two years and we are here, we are fighting and we did not change our plan to liberate our country, to liberate our people, to regain our sovereignty uh, and territorial integrity and to live peacefully in a European country ever after. So we know that uh, we are on the path to this plan and uh, we uh, are absolutely thankful to everyone who supports us in the matter. But the fact is that we need the West to switch from this perception of helping Ukraine to fight to letting Ukraine win the war. And it implies that there would be changes in how the weapons are released to deliver to us, how the sanctions actually work, and of course, the confiscation of the Russian assets that are being frozen right now at the Western countries, and it just needs to happen ASAP. OK, I'll get on to some of that in a moment. But let me ask you, considering that uh, President uh, Zelensky recently changed his commander in chief, someone who had been popular for the initial uh, resistance to the invasion, uh, I wonder what the sense is among the Ukrainian people, how much faith they have, how strong it is in the military structure of Ukraine and the people fighting. Well, the military structure and uh, Ukrainian army, uh, they have like the most faith and the most support amongst Ukrainians, uh, like as none of the other institutions have. And it's not a personality that we believe in, it's just general organization. Because like when we wake up in the morning and we know that there was an attack uh, of the missiles at night and most of them were taken down, we say not like thank you to a particular person. We think, oh, thank God our armed forces 
um, have defended us yet again. So uh, right now the support didn't change. And if, as you know, Ukraine as a country acts as one huge volunteering organization. So even people who are not fighting uh, at the front are very much involved in the supporting army with the donations, with the volunteering and purchasing of the weapons, drones, everything that is uh, needed uh, to continue the fight. Give me an idea of the impact of the financial and military delays from the Allies. What impact is that having on you? Well, uh, right now, um, we understand that uh, because there is no predictability of the, um, of the um, uh, upcoming help, uh, we, um, we have really issues with our budgeting planning. And we know that uh, at the middle of the year, the, there could be uh, potential issues uh, with the state payments. We hope it would not get to that. But it is still um, a complicated situation. So for you to understand, it is that um, all the money that we are using and that we are gathering as a state, we are using for our military expenses. And the humanitarian and financial support from our allies, we are using to pay for the state expenses and to the rebuild for everything. So um, it is critical that we maintain both uh, supports because we, uh, if we don't fight, we cannot exist as a state. If we don't exist as a state, it's a question of people how, like, what they are fighting for. So, if our um, our military commandment has reported at the end of the last year that the difference between the artillery from Russia and from our side was twenty to one, right now it is perhaps different, but. Uh, for you to get the feeling that every day of the delay for the of the support is something where we uh, we are paying not only by our territories but more and more losses in human lives that is happening both at the front but also uh, for the people that are sleeping in their beds in the peaceful cities. Understood. So what what do European leaders say to you when you plead to them uh, for support? Well, they have uh, voted for the 50 billion of uh, the Ukraine facility uh, that will be sent to Ukraine over the four years. And it is um, a significant step and it's something that allows us to plan ahead. However, what we really need right now is, again, weapons. And the issue is that the European countries cannot ramp up their military production as fast as we need it. And they are saying that they are doing everything from their side, but there are things that literally take time and we understand it but we need to push forward we need to make sure that all the political promises that be made right now are executed because uh, there has been many promises last year but not of them were delivered to the hands of ukrainian soldiers what, what fear do you have personally that the the length of this conflict going on now two years uh, will create a sort of fatigue in the international community, also among the public internationally, uh, that might dramatically affect the level of support you, you feel and that you need? I think we have been talking a lot about how to support Ukraine to win the war, and we did not talk enough about what's going to happen if we lose this war. Well, I think after recent Putin's announcements and interviews and actions, it is very clear that he would not stop in Ukraine. So if the West would allow itself to feel the fatigue right now, at some point they will have to hear military horns blowing and they will have to find themselves. And I think uh, the recent statements by uh, many um, uh, defense ministers of uh, European countries who were saying that they see that there are some plans of Russia to attack uh, NATO countries. Um, so you cannot feel fatigue at this point where your intelligence is say, well, the enemy may attack us soon. So this is why I think uh, the only public that can feel fatigue is our soldiers who are fighting at the front. For the rest, we do not have this luxury. And we wouldn't have for some time until the threat that Russia poses to the dem democratic countries will be eliminated. Now, one thing we know is the news cycles can be very fickle and eyes turn very quickly to other areas. Of course, the 7th of October was a major uh, incident in Israel. And I wonder to what degree that kind of perhaps detracted from what was happening in Ukraine and perhaps took away some of the attention that you perhaps needed. 
we um, we found this as uh, uh, I, people's eyes were turned away from Ukraine. However, uh, again, there will be many things that disrupt the attention. Like, for example, right now, the United States and European countries are in electoral cycle and they're getting ready for the elections. So that's on the top of the news. So our goal right now is to make sure that all the promises and the intentions are being written, signed and sealed. So we have something to rely on. And this is what President Zelensky is doing right now, signing the defense agreements or security agreements or whatever like you, you can call it with different countries. Like, uh, and we have all designed with Britain, with France, with Germany. Um, and uh, there would be additional ones with Canada and um, um, uh, more countries. So, so that we would know that it does not depend on the public opinion if it changes its attention or it doesn't depend on who is in charge but that is a position of the country of a state that understands what is at stake just a quick follow-up on this issue though you know the pictures from both fronts from gaza and also from ukraine have been pretty horrific what do the people of ukraine think and feel when they see those pictures coming out of gaza out of interest um mostly all ukrainian people know that the war is the most terrible thing that could happen to you. And that you uh, you should do everything possible and impossible to stop it. And uh, in, in most of the cases, you also know that uh, you have to fight for your uh, for what is right and you have to defend your own country. So when you uh, when your sovereign state is attacked, you have to re reply and you have to um, defend yourself and make sure that you prevent um, everything that you prevent um, all the terrors from happening. This is the key point because if we are looking at the uh, at our future, one of the questions is not only how to win the war, but how to make sure that Russia would not attack us again. Right. And I think that's a question that you do not have a solution. Nobody has a solution just yet because you cannot trust the agreements with them. You cannot. Uh, assure and can you trust the assurance and you cannot assure your citizens of how they know that if they're getting on a plane uh, Russia would not shot, shoot it down okay. and they uh, this is something that happened uh, a couple of times in Ukraine so this is um, a, a very painful matter and we just believe that um, we just believe that uh, in future, we will be able to set some way of prevention to that. They are, of course, very different uh, conflicts, very different fronts, but I was curious to get that perspective. Let me ask you, though, how you respond to President Vladimir Putin's uh, constant uh, statement that it's basically NATO threatening Russia, that the, the proximity of NATO getting closer to Russia enhanced basically a threat as far as you saw it. And of course, that the US, for example, other NATO countries would feel equally threatened and perhaps react the same way if the situation was reversed. How do you respond to that? Uh, so Putin's ideas that he is somehow threatened have nothing to do to what we can or cannot do as a sovereign state. To become members of EU and NATO is the will of Ukrainian people and as a state, we can and we are allowed to do that. And it was only the intentions that we have um, uh, we have made public in 2014 when Putin first annexed Crimea and uh, took a part of our uh, East. And it's completely unacceptable. So we understand that there are some um, influences and uh, uh, some geopolitical steps that can be taken, but the uh, the act of an aggression is something absolutely unacceptable and 100% uh, uh, not what can be done. Uh, and committing of all kinds of the war crimes um, that were committed by Russian soldiers were committed by Russia. When I'm looking at the eyes of women who were raped by Russian soldiers, should we tell them, oh, this was done to you because Putin thought that Ukraine will be joining NATO at some point? It's like completely unacceptable and it's a different level of humanity. So Putin is making up every time another story of why he is doing what he's doing, why he attacked uh, Georgia, why he attacked Ukraine. And uh, uh, he still cannot explain it 
to even to his own citizens. And he is always changing his opinions about like why he started the war and did he achieve uh, his goals. I want to remind you that two years ago, he started the full scale invasion, not because of the NATO, because he was saying that he uh, found some Nazis in Ukraine or something. Understood, yeah. I wonder though, uh, when President Putin says Ukraine can't win, is there pressure uh, on Ukraine to go to talks, to actually try to resolve this now with talks? Well, uh, we stopped uh, listening what Putin says or any of his offers a while ago, because we know that, again, you cannot trust Russia on one hand, and second, there is no way of making them uh, go with what they have promised. And it's one of the biggest issues with any negotiations or any discussions is who or what can make sure that Russia keeps their part of the bargain. Because as of right now, Ukrainian army is the only thing that is stopping Putin from doing what he what he plans to. And uh, there is like not another way of uh, pressure, not neither from NATO or not from anybody else, on uh, on making sure that Russia behaves. So well, right now, any negotiations should be backed by some of the mechanisms of making sure that they go with it. And there is there is no such mechanism. We do not see it just yet. So this is why until there is some of the ways we have, we see only one way of uh, making sure that um, we are not killed by another Russian attack to fight back and to make sure that they leave our country, leave our territories and liberate our people. You've got the Russian elections coming just around the corner now and it doesn't look like there's going to be much change in the leadership there. Uh, so I wonder, have you found any support among the Russian people for the Ukrainian position? Do you get any expressions of, of support coming from there? That was one of the biggest disappointments that we felt, uh, especially at the beginning of the full-scale invasion, where we had this illusion that Russian people, um, that they just don't know what's going on or that they uh, don't uh, uh, support what Putin is doing. What we see right now is they're pretty much aware of what's going on, and it's been Russian um, strategy for centuries uh, to, uh, to re resolve the internal issues with the external expansion. And most of Russians do support Putin for real, not only uh, because they are very much afraid, but because this is how the propaganda worked on them. So we see uh, rare... Uh, statements from either Russian uh, so-called opposition or with uh, some of the protesters in Russia, but we have no hopes for that. Okay. Look, after the death of Alexei Navalny, like, there could have been anticipation that people will rebel at least for that, but they did not do it. So we do not see how and why they would. Um, they, it would be something different okay. right now during the elections. Well, However, what the countries that believe in democracy can do is stop acknowledging Putin as um, uh, elected uh, president and um, uh, just like stop the handshaking and any uh, agreement that Russia is still operating as, as some kind of a democracy because it is obviously not. A couple of quick more questions before we wrap up. I, I know, of course, people are watching what's happening in the US election too. Donald Trump seems like the strongest candidate, according to a lot of analysts. I wonder, you know, he says he could end the war in a day, but I know you've described him as a huge threat to security of Ukraine. Why do you think things would be so negative under him? Well, uh, first of all, uh, President Zelensky, not once and maybe a couple of times, already invite Mr. Trump to come to Ukraine and see for himself. And I think um, that would be the first thing to do if one really wants to find a solution uh, of how to make sure that uh, the war ends and ends on Ukrainian terms. Second, I think uh, promising to end the war in one day is a, a very populist statement of trying to find the simple solution to a very complicated problem. And I think we have already seen in the history of the world how this doesn't work. And uh, the question is not only about Ukraine, but about the position of, uh, of um, United States as a leader of the democratic world. How can you uh, trust the leader uh, if uh, at some point when the situation changes or when the president changes, uh, the position to uh, support the democracies again, authoritarian regime may change and may give something to the authoritarian regime. And the, the war that we are in is 
actually for a precedent that mm -hmm. in 21st century, one country can annex the territory of another one and get away with that, commit all kinds of war, of war crimes and get away with it. We are fighting against this possibility, okay. saying, no, this is not the world that we want to live in. And the question would be to the U.S. president, whoever he would be, okay. is he going to support this president? A quick thought at a personal level, Ms. Rudik. You worked in the IT sector before. Two years have gone by and your life has changed dramatically with you now in politics. You're a highly educated person with, with languages, chemistry, mathematics, physics. Um, you know, you've had a lot of experience in the education world. How has your life changed personally and what keeps you hopeful and what will happen after the uh, conflict ends, which it will eventually be hope? Um, on, on January 2nd, there was a missile hit near my home. And I have witnessed it personally. I was at home and I have seen it. I have seen how my windows were blown away and, uh, and the shattered glass was everywhere. And I have witnessed my neighbors being severely injured. And I have witnessed all the fires and damages and pain and suffering that, that Russia brings here. And thank God I, I, was only, I had only minor injuries. But that was a very traumatic experience for me, perhaps even more traumatic than uh, visiting Butch after it was liberated. Um, but this is what we feel every single day as, uh, as citizens. Uh, night attacks on when you, when you sleep in the bomb shelter or have to go to the bomb shelter early in the morning. Um, inability to plan for more than one week. Or, or maybe less. Spending lots of your times under the air raid sirens with a threat. Um, so life for you... It only creates... Yeah, so life for you has yeah. changed quite dramatically and you can't see any change back to your old life at right now, it seems. We need, we need to acknowledge that it is impossible to come back how it was before, that life is gone. Okay. Because we are all traumatized and uh, we have all seen and witnessed things that normal person should not. Okay, well... But what did not change is our resolve and our grit to make sure that we win the war and we are able to define our own future. I think it's very important how, how things that we ta we're taking for granted and that are being taken for granted in, in many places right now, how we, it put in perspective that there are some things that you are actually willing to die for and go ahead when, when they are threatened. Okay. And these values are the freedom, the, the, the liberty. And uh, it is much more important that you are thinking it is for you. And this is why we are not going to step back. This is why we are going to, to win the war and we are going to fight for as long as it is necessary, because okay. this is how we value it, Kira even Rudik. after two years of complete terror. Well, Kira Rudik, I want to thank you very much for taking the time out to speak to us. I'll no doubt speak to you again soon. Thank you, and glory to Ukraine.